Hey, good morning. Um, today we are going to do exercise 15, Surface Anatomy, from the um, sixth edition of the Lab Manual for Anatomy and Physiology by Allen and Harper, so AP1. This is Dr. Anju Singh doing the recording. So the uh, main purpose of this chapter is uh, we've done, you know, skeletal system, we've done muscle system, we know what the muscle looks like under the microscope. Uh, we've named all the different, um, we've learned the names of all the different muscles in the body and their actions and all the movements they cause, um, and, you know, names of the different bones and everything. However, um, in real life, in clinics, you don't get to go inside the human body to figure out which muscle is hurt or which bone is broken or um, what organ, you know, uh, how to identify organs. We have to do in the real world in clinics, a lot of stuff has to be initially evaluated and assessed um, through an intact body. So um, surface anatomy becomes extremely important in being able to locate um, where different things are. So by looking at the surface and surface landmarks um, or by palpating, palpate means to touch. So by either by looking or by touching, um, and sometimes on x-rays and other things, you know, by different mechanisms, we are able to look at things. Uh, but by knowing the anatomy of the surface, know their correlation with the organs inside, um, mainly because everything is pretty consistent across the board in the human body. There is always slight variation, individual variations. So some arteries or nerves may be slightly different in some people, but that variation is in a very, very small minority. So for the most part, it is safe to depend on surface landmarks to know the structures or to palpate or to touch the structures and identify them to know what's going on with the patient. So that's the importance of this chapter. All right. So um, let's start by naming some uh, from the head. Um, and some of this is pretty, you know, no brainer because you'll, we kind of sort of touched on this as we were going along. So the first thing in this figure, this is figure 15.1, um, the, uh, the part labeled A, that would be the frontalis muscle, lies below the skin. So if you were to raise your eyebrows, the muscle that you feel, and I would like you to, as you're going through this, palpate these muscles, feel these muscles on your own body uh, to make sure you are able to identify them. So if you lift your eyebrows and you put your finger on your forehead just above your eyebrows, you will feel the contraction of this muscle. So that is your frontalis muscle, or rather the frontalis belly of your occipital frontalis muscle. All right. Um, and then you uh, see over there the um, orbicularis oculi muscle has been marked. So if you were to squeeze your eye shut, that muscle that you feel in your eyelid, that's your orbicularis oculi muscle. Now remember that is different from your elevator palpebrae muscle. Elevator palpebrae muscle is the muscle in your eyelid that helps you open and close your eyelids. So the elevator palpebrae, levator palpebrae muscle will elevate your eyelids and help you open your eyes. All right, so that's, so there are two different muscles um, in your upper eyelid itself, levator palpebrae and orbicularis oculi. So when you squeeze your eyes shut, the orbicularis oculi muscle is contracting. But when you lift your eyelid, when you open your eye, your levator palpebrae muscle is contracting. All right. Now, if you were to feel the bony margin on top um, of your, on the upper margin of your orbit, just, you know, aligned pretty much with the eyebrow, that is the supraorbital margin. All right. So that is the superior border of the uh, frontal bone that, um, that borders the orbit. Okay, so feel free to palpate that and see if you can palpate the um, supravital notch, which is at the junction of the medial one third and lateral two third of the supra or vital margin. And that is labeled number four in this figure. Then comes the nasal bone, which is labeled number five. So again, if you palpate your nose, if you start kind of sort of right um, between your eyebrows and then gently palpate down, you will see um, um, that you, you should be able to palpate where the nasal bone ends and the nasal cartilage begins. 
because if you try to move it laterally, where uh, as long as you're on the nasal bone, there will be no movement sideways. But as soon as you come to the cartilage, you'll be able to move the nose a little bit with your finger. All right. So see if you can identify that joint between the nasal bone and the nasal cartilage. And this is important. Again, we've talked about this when we did the skeletal system. If a person um, is, um, you know, is hit in the face, especially if the the blunt force is pointing um, superiorly and posteriorly, as if getting punched in the face um, uh, from ahead, uh, the nasal bone can fracture, and that can also fracture the cribriform fossa, and then there is cerebrospinal fluid leaking out through the nose. So there may not be any outer damage visible, but nasal bone fracture is very often um, occurs simultaneously with cribriform plate fracture, and the patient comes with clear fluid leaking from the nose. That clear fluid leaking from the nose is, is a sign of cerebrospinal fluid leaking, uh, which is a very ominous sign because um, the person can develop meningitis. All right. Um, number two in this figure is the zygomaticus major muscle. Again, if you want to put your finger on your cheek and then smile, if you feel that muscle that gets pulled, that's the zygomaticus major muscle. Um, then comes the depressor labi inferioris muscle. Again, if this is a muscle, when it contracts, it pulls the lower lip downwards. Um, and then below that, number three is the mental protuberance. That is the bony ridge, the bony part of your chin um, that you can feel. Um, number six is the body of the mandible. And I need you to be able to identify these different parts of the mandible. Know where the ramus of the mandible is, the body of the mandible, and the mental protuberance. All right, so these are different structures. And then the angle of the mandible. In this view, the anterior view of the head, we are able to see the body of the um, mandible and the mental protuberance. You can kind of sort of see the... Um, let me see if we can do this and that at the same time. Um, yeah, I guess we can, but I don't have a pen or do I? Yes, I do. This is awesome. Okay, so right here, this is the uh, mental protuberance right here. The tip of your chin is the mental protuberance. This here will be the body of the mandible. And this is the ramus of the mandible. And then this will be the angle right here. All right, so I need you to be able to identify these four things separately on the mandible itself. Now, the condyla process cannot be um, sort of palpated, if you will, uh, from the surface, but that's where uh, the, the condyla process would be inside here. It's part of your temporal mandibular joint. So it is inside the joints. So you cannot palpate it from the outside. But if you were to open and close your jaw, that joint is moving, and that would be your temporal mandibular joint. All right. What else? So we've covered um, frontalis muscle, zygomaticus muscle, the mental protuberance, the suprabital margin, the nasal bone, the body of the mandible. So we've covered everything in this figure. Oh, yes, the orbicularis oris muscle. Um, so if you were to tightly squeeze your lips uh, as if saying the letter O or whispering or whistling, that muscle that is around your mouth, the circular muscle around the mouth, that is your orbicularis oris muscle. All right. Coming to uh, figure 15.1b, uh, this is uh, the right lateral view of the head. So now you'll be able to see the structures on the side of the head. Number seven here is your temporalis muscle. So if you put your finger just superior and anterior to your ear, so this would be the pinna of the ear. So this part of the ear, that is known as the pinna. All right, so if you put your finger up here, just uh, superior and anterior to the pinna of the ear, and you clench your teeth, you will feel this muscle contracting. So this, is mus this muscle helps in mastication and chewing movement. All right. Um, number eight is your occ occipitalis muscle. Again, some people are able to contract this muscle and move their scalp back and forth. See if you can do that. Um, 
Number nine is the external occipital protuberance. Again, if you were to feel, if you run your finger through the center of your neck, you know, uh, the gap between the muscles in the back of your neck right here, if you run your finger up through that gap, the first bony protuberance that you feel as you go up, you know, you'll actually feel that protuberance. You'll be able to feel this protuberance in your bone. Um, that is your external occipital protuberance. And, uh, and as we've seen, um, we have muscles getting attached there. And tell me if you can identify this muscle. You should know the name of the muscles being attached there. All right, number 10 is the mastoid process. Again, uh, this is a rounded projection to the inferior portion of the temporal bone, posterior to the ear. So again, go behind posterior to the ear um, and feel this bony protuberance, and you'll be able to feel a nice rounded bony protuberance over here. That is your mastoid process. All right. Um, number 11 is the ramus of the mandible. This is the ramus of the mandible, angle of the mandible, body of the mandible, and the mental protuberance over here. All right. Uh, number 12 is the temporomandibular joint. And number 13 is the masseter muscles. Again, if you clench your teeth um, and put your finger over here, just anterior to the pinna of the ear or the external auditory meatus, um, the muscle that you feel that you know, protrudes out over here, that is your masseter muscle. And your parotid glands are um, right, situated right here too. All right, so that's it for this chap, this figure. Moving on. Now we come to figure 15.1C showing the anterior view of the neck. Uh, number one in this figure is where the common carotid artery is located. And um, again, I would encourage you to see if you can find your carotid pulse right here. Feel with the tip of the fingers, the pulp of the fingers, um, and um, just go just besides the trachea in that little gap between the trachea and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And if you, um, you should be able to um, palpate the carotid artery there. So that is your common carotid artery situated right there. Um, in, you know, in movies and stuff, you would have watched that somewhere. Sometimes that's where they look for the pulse of a person. Number two is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Again, if you move your neck right and left, this muscle starts right here at the manubrium of the sternum and goes all the way across diagonally across the neck, all right? And it has a sternocleido because it has another head over here, sternocleidomastoid muscle, and goes all the way up to the mastoid process, all right? Um, and then comes the clavicle, that is the bone, on the, the shoulder bone, okay? Um, that's easy to palpate and it is often broken in athletes, um, like when they play rugby or football and they fall on their shoulder, clavicle bone is um, often fractured. Number four is the hyoid bone. Again, make sure you know how to differentiate between the hyoid bone and the cricoid bone, all right? Number five is the, um, sorry, the, th the thyroid bone. Number four is the hyoid bone, and number five is the thyroid bone. Your thyroid cartilage, that is your Adam's apple that moves up and down when you swallow. So that is very easy to identify. But if you palpate up superiorly, uh, you should be able to palpate the um, hyoid bone. And again, it's clinical importance. We've talked about that. Um, looking for fracture of the hyoid bone is one way to distinguish between um, death by strangulation um, versus death by hanging. All right, if a person hung themselves and and that's how they asphyxiated and died, the hyoid bone would be fractured. However, if they were strangled by someone else and then the body was hung, the hyoid bone will not be fractured. And that is um, used to differentiate between um, suicide and homicide. All right.
Um, number six is the cricoid cartilage. And number seven is the suprasternal notch. All right, so this notch here, this V-shaped notch between the two sternocleidomastoid muscles, that is your suprasternal notch. Let's see if I can pause this. Another, uh, another couple of quick points before we move on from this figure. So the clinical importance of knowing how to palpate the cricoid cartilage is um, that's used to locate the trachea in order to do tracheostomy. So if you were to feel, you know, start with feeling the most prominent landmark on your neck, the Adam's apple, that is the thyroid cartilage. If you move your finger just below that, there's a slight depression. And then past the depression inferiorly, the first cartilage that you feel, that's the cricoid cartilage. And if you go below that, what you're feeling there is the trachea. And again, if you palpate it with your finger, you'll be able to actually feel the difference as soon as you touch your trachea. So if you, you know, and it's not as protected with the thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage anteriorly. So you're gonna actually feel, uh, and if you, you know, palpate a little more uh, firmly, it may stimulate a cough reflex. That's when you know you've touched your trachea. So the trachea, again, let me see if I got my pen here. Um, All right, so, okay, so you got your uh, thyroid cartilage here. This is your cricoid cartilage. right here, this is the cricoid cartilage. And as soon as you go below that, and you come just above your sternal, uh, uh, suprasternal notch, that is where your thyroid is located. And this is usually where a tracheostomy is done. All right, so that's one clinical importance. And then the other thing I need you to know is the anterior triangle of the neck. The boundaries of the anterior triangle of the neck are the inferior margin of the mandible, the midline of the neck and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. All right, so you have two anterior angles, one on either side. The importance of this angle is uh, the important structures here are your common carotid artery and your internal jugular vein. Now we did not do the external jugular vein. The external jugular vein is lateral to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. All right, so in this figure, it is labeled on the left side. So the sternocleidomastoid muscle on the left will be here. All right, so this is your sternocleidomastoid muscle. Medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscles will be your uh, internal carotid, uh, common carotid artery. And lateral to it will be your external jugular vein. Your internal jugular vein lies between the two of them. All right, and it is in the um, anterior triangle. Maybe I'll try and mark the vein with the blue marker, except every time I touch something, I change the slide. So I'm still kind of finicky around this thing. That's why I'm not trying to keep changing pens here. All right, so that is your anterior triangle. So this could be like, you know, a question, say a multiple choice question, boundaries of the anterior triangle or what's inside the anterior triangle. And your options could be the common carotid artery, the internal jugular vein and the um, external jugular vein. Just know that the external jugular vein is not in the anterior triangle of the neck, okay? There is a posterior triangle and we'll get to that in a minute. So these are, uh, and one more applied um, concept is the thyroid gland. Um, see if you can palpate the thyroid gland in your neck. Again, start with the Adam's apple. That's like your biggest go-to landmark in your, you know, in the, in the midline of the neck. So if you um, start with the Adam's apple of the thyroid cartilage, it is um, just inferior and lateral to that. It'll be a soft tissue mass. And if you swallow, the soft tissue mass will move up and down as you swallow. It is more evident in people whose thyroid gland is enlarged. And one way to know if it's a thyroid gland and not some other tumor is um, identify number one, a swelling. So it'll be like a swelling right here. If it's unilateral, the swelling will be right here. If it's bilateral, the swelling will be sort of central, but right here. All right, so this is where your thyroid gland is located. And if the patient swallows, this lump will move up uh, with swallowing. 
And so you know that this is an enlarged thyroid gland. Very rarely, the only condition in which a thyroid gland is enlarged but does not move, um, it can be adherent to the adjacent structures that would be in carcinoma of the thyroid. So it, with that exception, um, thyroid gland does move up and down with swallowing. We then come to figure 15.1D, shows the lateral view of the neck. Here, again, number one is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Number two shows the levator um, scapulae muscle. Number three shows the trapezius muscle. And number four is the scalene muscles. So scalene muscles are the muscles lying in between the sternocleidomastoid and the levator scapulae muscle. Here lies the posterior triangle of the neck. So the posterior triangle of the neck, its boundaries are anteriorly the sternocleidomastoid muscle, posteriorly the trapezius muscle, and inferiorly uh, the clavicle. Let me see if I can draw it here. Um, so it is a sternocleidomastoid muscle, clavicle, and uh, posteriorly the trapezius muscle. All right, goes all the way here and like this. So this is your posterior triangle, all right? And the structures within the posterior triangle, again, uh, see if you can identify, palpate this and make sure you're able to identify the boundaries of the posterior triangle. Is your brachial plexus. Plexus is the network of nerves that are coming out of the spine and they, um, most of these nerves go to the arm. So any injury, say a stab injury in the break in this area can um, paralyze or can injure the brachial plexus and can paralyze that side, that arm. So again, we have two posterior triangles, one on either side. And the external jugular vein is located here too. All right, so that is your posterior triangle. All right. So from here, then we move on to the uh, surface anatomy of the chest. So here we have figure 15.2, anterior view of the chest. So again, we start superiorly. We've already um, identified the clavicle by surface anatomy and the suprasternal notch. If you go below the suprasternal knot, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, so I'm going to draw it with the red pen here. This is the clavicle. Here's the suprasternal notch. All right. So just below the suprasternal notch, that bone, that's the manubrium of the sternum. And if you palpate down from the manubrium of the sternum, you will come to the sternal angle. All right. Um, this is, the uh, this is the manubrium, sorry, this, uh, right here was the suprasternal notch. This is the manubrium of the sternum and you palpate down, you will feel the angle. Um, that is the um, sternal angle, all right? Right at the level of the sternal angle, that is the level of the second rib, all right? And the importance of this level right here is important is because this is where, um, we auscultate or listen through the stethoscope for heart sounds on the right and left intracostal, second intracostal space. So the space between the ribs right there. That's where we hear for certain valve sounds. So our auscultation of the heart is done right there. So again, from clinical point of view, it is very important to identify the level of the second rib and therefore the second intercostal space for auscultation purposes. All right, if you go below the sternal angle, uh, that's where you're feeling the, um, the body of the sternum. So number two is the body of the sternum. So this whole thing is the body of the sternum and it ends in the xiphoid process. So uh, number three is the uh, xiphy sternal joint. And number four is the xiphoid process of the sternum. And if you wanna feel the xiphoid process of the sternum, identify the costal margin Right here, number 10 is the costal margin. So if you were to feel your ribs and keep palpating medially till you come to the midline. And um, when you come to the midline right there, that will be way, uh, right under there is where your zephyte process of the sternum is. All right. 
Uh, number one in this figure is uh, showing where the second rib is. Number two is the body of the sternum. Number three is the ziphysternal joint. Number four is the ziphoid process of sternum. Number five is the serratus anterior muscle. Now in this person, in this figure, of course, it is easy to see the serratus anterior muscle. However, I'd like you to take a minute to see if you can identify the serratus anterior muscle in yourself because this can be a little tricky. So flex your forearm and abduct your elbow, okay? And use the opposite arm. So if you're flexing your right forearm and abducting your right elbow, use your left hand to palpate the serratus anterior as it abducts the scapula. Be very, very careful that you identify the serratus anterior muscle because if you move too far posteriorly, you will be pal palpating the latissimus dorsi muscle. And the latissimus dorsi is not labeled here, so I will label it for you. This muscle here, this will be your latissimus dorsi. All right, so you wanna be able to distinguish between these two muscles, all right? The serratus anterior and the latissimus dorsi muscle. Um, that was number five. So number six is the manubrium of the sternum. Number seven is the sternal angle. Number eight is the pectoralis major muscle. Uh, so pectoralis major muscle is the major muscle of the chest. Um, in, a, in a buff muscular male, it is easily identified as a curved line just under the breast. However, in order for you to palpate exactly where your pectoralis major muscle is, what you can do is uh, kind of sort of do a push up just on one uh, arm. Uh, so say, suppose you're, you're going to push up on your right arm, use the left uh, hand to palpate the pectoralis major muscle and see if you can identify uh, the boundaries of the pectoralis major muscle, all right? That is number eight. Number nine is your ribs, which are deep to the muscle, you know, and, and, and can get confusing. You see how number nine and number five are kind of sort of pointing to the same thing. Um, because the serratus anterior muscle attaches to the ribs over there. That's why they have muscles written in parentheses there. Number 10 is the costal margin. It is very important to identify the costal margin because again, it's an important surface landmark, especially on the right side in order to palpate the liver just under the costal margin and to know whether a liver is enlarged or not, to know how far um, below the costal margin it does. In a normal healthy adult, the liver is very soft and just barely palpable under the costal margin. However, um, in hepatitis, whether it is a viral hepatitis or alcoholic hepatitis, uh, the liver can be enlarged. In advanced uh, chronic alcoholic hepatitis or in uh, cirrhosis of the liver or liver carcinoma, the liver can be hardened. So it's no more just enlarged, it'll also be enlarged and hard. Um, the diaphragm is located between the fourth and the fifth intercostal space. So you see, <clears throat> two was your um, uh, your second rib. Your second rib was where number one is. So palpate below that to the third rib, and then to the fourth rib. So. Uh, the fourth and fifth intercostal space, that is where your diaphragm is. And remember the diaphragm separates the chest cavity, the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So that's how high your abdominal cavity actually goes up to. Now, if you were to take a deep breath, you enlarge the thoracic cavity significantly. But at rest um, and at the end of a normal um, exhalation at rest, that is the level of the diaphragm and that is how high <clears throat> the abdominal cavity is from the surface, all right? Um, so uh, before we move on, just again, a few more clinical pointers here. You should be able to identify where the trachea is, you know, located between the cricoid cartilage and the larynx and the sternal angle, uh, again, because it is uh, important for tracheostomy. Um, in, in case of emergency, if someone's actually choking and you're in a remote area and don't have easy access to um, emergency services or it'll take a long time for an ambulance to come there and, and a Heimlich procedure is not working, if a person is choking, it's a life-saving procedure to use just any sharp tool available like a kitchen knife to actually make a hole in the trachea. 
But in order to know where to make that hole, one needs to know how to identify the trachea. Um, and that is a life-saving procedure in someone who is choking but cannot get uh, medical help immediately. So identifying the trachea is very important. Uh, the primary bronchi, the trachea divides into the right and left bronchi at the level of the sternal angle. This is again important when we're looking at chest x-rays and stuff. We're looking for either obstructions or carcinoma or lymph nodes in the lung and stuff when you're looking at an x-ray uh, to know what we're looking at or if there's an abnormality in the structure there, just to know where does the trachea divide into the right and left uh, primary bronchi. And that is at the level of the sternal angle. The lungs, the apex of the lung is actually way up there above the clavicle in normal healthy adults. And the base of the lung rests on the diaphragm, which as we just said, is lying at the level of the fourth and fifth intercostal space. All right, so that's how uh, large your lung is at rest. The heart is located between the second and the sixth rib. Um, I did mention the importance of the second intercostal space. That's where we hear the sounds for the base of the heart. The apex of the heart is in the fourth intercostal space, just um, lateral and inferior to the mid axillary line. Okay, so if you were to um, draw a line through the center here, this would be like the mid axillary line. All right. And just inferior and lateral to the mid axillary line in the fourth intercostal space. The right here, this is the sound for the apex of the heart. And when we auscultate, that's where we're looking for heart sounds. All right, so just know the heart does not go up till there. That's where the sound is heard. So know that know, know the difference. We hear the sounds depending on uh, what tissue overlies it. So of course, over a bony structure, it'll be hard to listen to a sound. Um, and because of the direction of the sound, um, that is the space where you can best hear the apex of the heart, uh, spe specifically when we're looking for valve malfunctions. And depending on which valve we are listening to, these are some of the landmarks we use to listen to the heart sounds. All right, so the heart is located between the second and the sixth rib. The heart rests on the diaphragm, uh, uh, just below the xiphysternal joint. Um, and the heart is about the size of your fist. Two thirds of the heart lies on the left of the midline. Again, in very few cases, the heart can lie on the right side. All right, that is situs invertus. But in majority of cases, the heart does lie on the left side. The aortic arch is superior border of the aortic arch is posterior to the sternal angle and anterior to the trachea. Again, um, in aortic coarctation in certain other conditions, we need to be able to identify the aortic arch. So, uh, so uh, that's again why surface anatomy is important is be able to know the different structures where they lie just by knowing the surface anatomy. So with that, we finished um, the uh, surface anatomy of the anterior part of the trunk, and we move on to the surface anatomy of the abdomen. So this is figure 15.2 in your lab manual. Coming to the abdomen, um, some of the most important features. So if you were to place your hands on your hips, the bony structure that you feel that you rest your hand on, that is your iliac crest. All right, and if you palpate the iliac crest um, anteriorly and inferiorly, you will feel a bump. That bump is the anterior um, end of, that is your anterior superior iliac spine. So number nine in this diagram. So if you were to rest your hand on your hips, you'd be resting them right here somewhere, right? This is your iliac crest. And then if you palpate down and come down here, this bony um, bump that you feel, and it's very evident, especially in lean people, it's very easy to see, that is the anterior superior iliac spine. All right, so number nine, here's the, the most prominent landmark in the abdomen is the umbilicus right here in the center, okay? If you were to draw a line from the umbilicus to the anterior iliac spine, anterior superior iliac spine, and divide that line into three equal parts, one, and two. All right, so you see the junction of the medial two third and the lateral one third. This junction right here is known as McBurney's point. 
All right. So number five in your um, figure is McBurney's point. This is where if, uh, if a patient who has pain in the abdomen in the right iliac fossa area, if you touch at the McBurney's point, the patient will have a sharp tang of pain. That's how you know that the pain is because of an appendis appendicitis. Usually, pain can be referred. A lot of appendix pain may initially start as epigastric pain and then later on um, move and focus at the iliac fossa. But uh, a hallmark clinical feature of appendicitis is pain at the McBurney's point. And this is where an incision is made to, to do an appendicectomy. So you again, see the importance of surface anatomy. You must know the structures and their relationship. <clears throat> You must know the internal structures and their relationship um, by knowing their distance from some important landmarks on the surface. All right. Then coming back to um, the center of the abdomen, the big muscle, like in muscular people, the six pack ab that we call, that is the um, rectus abdominis muscle. So number one in this figure is the rectus abdominis muscle. And these, uh, the six pack, if you will, this thing that divides it into six pack, these are known as the tendinous intersections um, in the belly of the rectus abdominis muscle. And the lateral border of the, of the rectus abdominis muscle is the linea semilunaris. Semi Again, it is, uh, this is pretty evident in either very lean or very muscular people the linea semilunaris, um, and, and I would encourage you to lie down in a supine position and try to do a sit-up. And when you do a sit-up, you should be able to palpate your rectus abdominis muscle and see if you can see the um, tendinous intersections and the, uh, uh, the linea semilunaris, all right? They should be evident in pretty much most of us. Of course, they are more evident in muscular people and certain features are more evident in uh, extremely lean people. But especially if you flex the muscle, you should be able to palpate it, all right? The central line in the abdomen up here, this is uh, known as the linea alba. Linea means line and alba is, it's, it's white. The uh, importance of this line, this is where an exploratory laparotomy is done. So if a patient comes in, say, with an acute abdomen, and we do not know the cause of the acute abdomen, it could be a ruptured um, ulcer, it could be a ruptured appendix, it could be a ruptured diverticulum. We don't know what the cause is. And so the doctor wants to go in, the surgeon wants to go in and explore all the abdominal structures and identify the cause of the problem. Um, in that case, an incision is made along the midline on the linea alba, and the reason that's done is because then the least damage to muscles is done there because it's an insertion of the muscles, and it, it heals with scarring and fibrosis, so it will not impede the function of the muscles after recovery. All right, so that is a um, point for... Um, exploratory laparotomy. Of course, nowadays, we don't do that that often anymore. Nowadays, we do a um, three-port laparotomy where the abdomen is inflated with air and the patient is put in a head low position. So the abdominal contents are moved up and it's filled with air. And so they can do other procedures too. But um, in some cases, they, we, this is still done. All right. Um, what else do we have? So make sure we've got everything covered here. Number one is rectus abdominis muscle. Number two is the linea semilunaris. Number three is the external oblique muscle. All right, so if you were, if you're working out and you twist and you, you know, twist your body right and left, that muscle that helps you twist, that is your um, external oblique muscle. And number four is your iliac crest, the bony um, structure that you rest your hands on when you put your hands on your hips. Number five was the McBurney's point. Number six is linea alba. Number seven is tinea intersection. And number eight is the umbilicus. An important, again, um, applied aspect, if you will. The line from the umbilicus down to the pubic symphysis is not the linea alba. All right. In women who have born children, they can be deposits of pigment along this line, all right? And that is then known as linea nigra. 
all right? In normal, uh, in, in males and in women who have not had children, you will not be able to see linear nigra. But in women who have born children, there's pigment deposited along the midline between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis. That line then is known as linear nigra, all right? So there's linear alba superior to the umbilicus between the umbilicus and visifis sternum, and linear nigra below the umbilicus from the umbilicus to the pubic symphysis only in women who have born children. All right, so just another something that you get from listening to the lecture because it's not there in the book. Again, I would highly encourage you to know the difference between the serratus anterior muscle here and the latissimus dorsi. All right. Going on to the anterolateral view of the abdomen, this is figure 15.2C in your manual. Number one is the tendinous intersection of the rectus abdominis muscle. Number two is the Mc, uh, McBurney's point, again, important from appendicitis and appendicectomy point of view. Number three is the serratus anterior muscle. Number four is the rectus abdominis muscle. Um, number five is the external oblique muscle. Number six is the iliac crest. And number seven is the anterior superior iliac spine. And we've pretty much covered all these before, so I'm not gonna go any more in detail with that. Just making sure I've got everything covered. A couple more um, clinical important stuff. Um, I, I mentioned earlier uh, palpating for the liver just below the um, costal margin. And again, the liver position can vary depending on, you know, whether you're depending on respiration and degree of distension of the stomach and the intestine and stuff like that. So the liver can move but it's usually felt under the costal margin. The gallbladder is uh, located deep to the lateral margin of the rectus abdominis muscle. And um, the umbilicus, as I said, is located at the level of L3, L4. Um, but from a neurological point of view, that's the level of T10 dermatome. And we may touch upon that when we do the nervous system, but just know at the level of the umbilicus is T10, the thoracic 10th vertebrae um, is at that level. Uh, and that's important because of spinal injuries, um, if there's paralysis above or below that level, um, and also in case of uh, spinal anesthesia, in case of um, um, uh, shingles, the shingles usually tends to affect spinal nerves and a dermatome, one certain nerve, one spinal nerve alone will have the shingles on it. So the shingle lesions are located along the area supplied by that nerve. So those are the importance of knowing these structures. Um, the common iliac arteries, these are the branches of the uh, abdominal iota. That is at the level of the anterior superior iliac spine. So now we move on to the surface anatomy of um, surface anatomy of the back. So it's figure 15.2 in the back. Let's start first with the shoulder. So if you were to feel your shoulders, the bony protrusion on the extremes of your shoulder, if you ever got a suit tailor made or any dress tailor made, when the tailor takes the shoulder measurements, they use this bony prominence on the tip of your shoulders as a guide for your shoulder measurements. So the acromion is that flattened lateral end of the spine of the scapula, all right? And, and it's, it, it, you can palpate it. Make sure you are able to make, make the difference uh, between the acromion process and the coracoid process. Then come the spine of the scapula, that is a ridge on the posterior surface of the border um, of the scapula. In this figure, um, let's see, number one is the trapezius muscle. So this is the large muscle um, that forms uh, the, the, the line of the neck um, and the middle of the back. It's a large triangular muscle, all right? Number two is your acromion process, the bony protrusion that you can feel uh, on the lateral edges of your uh, shoulder. Number three is the supraspinatus muscle. So uh, this muscle is, again, located superior to the spine of the scapula and if you have a subject you can sort of palpate this on, I don't know if you're able to uh, work with a, a um, family member 
to identify these muscles. Um, but if you feel the spine of the scapula, the muscle just above that spine, that's the supraspinatus muscle. And of course, the infraspinatus muscle is just below that. Um, that's number four, is the infraspinatus muscle. Five is your teres major muscle. The teres major muscle um, is again located inferior to the infraspinatus muscle. Um, Number uh, six is your erector spinae muscle. So if you were to bend down and then from that bend position, start standing up and palpate the muscle in your back, that muscle that helps you erect your spine, um, that is your erector spinae muscle. Um, and number seven is the spinous process of the thoracic vertebrae. So again, if you palpate along the midline, you will be able to feel the spinous process of all the vertebrae, of all the vertebrae. Um, so make sure you're able to do that. The important things from a clinical point of view, what is important is to be able to palpate L4, all right? Um, the lumbar, the fourth lumbar um, spine, because it is between L3 and L4 that a lumbar puncture is done, also known as a lumbar tap, to obtain uh, cerebrospinal fluid samples to run tests on, you know, to rule out meningitis or whatever. And that is also the place where um, any injections, uh, say intrathecal injections are given there because the blood-brain barrier is a very um, strong barrier. It does not allow medications from the blood to cross the blood-brain barrier and enter the brain. So if any medication has to be given on the other side of the blood-brain barrier, it has to be given through a, a lumbar puncture. Again, your um, Spinal taps, um, your spinal anesthesia is given at that level too. So patient is usually put on one side, right or left lateral position, and then asked to curl up in that curled up position. And when the whole spine is flexed, the distance between the vertebral processes is the largest. So it gives easy access to um, the uh, intervertebral gap. All right. Um, what else? Number Number nine is uh, number nine is the latissimus dorsi muscle. All right, and I also want you to be able to identify, say, um, the deltoid muscle. So right here, the big muscle on your shoulder, this would be the deltoid muscle. And what I would like you to do is, whoa, I cannot write on this thing. All right, so the deltoid muscle has anterior fibers, lateral fibers, and posterior fibers. So if you were to flex your arm you would feel the anterior fibers of the deltoid. If you were to abduct your arm, you would feel the lateral fibers. And then if you were to extend the arm, you would feel the posterior fibers. So I want you to do these movements and feel, put your hand on the muscle and see if you can feel the different um, uh, groups of fibers within this muscle. All right. Um, and also for the latissimus dorsi muscle and the teres major muscle together, form the posterior border of the axillary region. All right, so make sure you are able to identify them in a diagram. Moving on to figure 15.2e, this shows the posterior view of the back with the arms flexed. So the previous diagram, the arms were not flexed. And as you can see, this position changes uh, the position of the scapula and, um, you know, numerous other things can be seen here. So the first of all, number one is your deltoid muscle. And, and that is showing your lateral fibers, all right? Number two is showing the posterior fibers of the deltoid muscle. The anterior fibers cannot be seen because this is a posterior view. So all you can see is the lateral fibers and the posterior fibers. Um, Number three here is the triangle of auscultation. And I think I made a mention of this in the previous lecture, but uh, triangle, this is a triangular region on the back uh, formed by the latissimus dorsi muscle, the trapezius muscle, and the vertebral column of the scapula. The importance of this, again, from clinical point of view, this is the area where there's no bone or no large la uh, thick layers of muscles hindering uh, conduction of sound. So this is a good window, if you will, to listen to lung sounds. So that's where a doctor would put their stethoscope to try and listen to uh, lung sounds because from all other regions, the lung sounds would be more muffled because of the muscles there. 
All right, so that's the um, auscultation triangle number, th number three. Number four is the spinous process of the thoracic vertebrae. Uh, number five is the teres, um, the trapezius uh, muscle. Number six is the teres major muscle. Number seven is the vertebral column of the scapula. Again, you know, some people are able to move their scapula up and down. And when you do that, you can really see the angle of the scapula. And you can see the vertebral border of the scapula move up and down. Number eight is the latissimus dorsi muscle. And you see how it's one of the largest muscles in the back and sort of almost triangular in shape. So it's a triangle with its base along the uh, vertebral column <clears throat> and its tip going up to the posterior part of the axilla. Um, and, and the trapezius muscle is also kind of sort of triangular in, in the upper half of the back. All right, uh, number nine is the spinous process of the lumbar vertebrae. And that's about it. All right. So again, you may get this diagram and you may be able either be, uh, be asked to identify the structure uh, that the line is pointing to or a organ that lies under the structure or some applied aspect of it. Or it's, uh, if it's pointing to a muscle, what movement does the muscle do? So you'd be asked those kind of questions. All right, now moving on to the surface anatomy of the uh, pelvis. This is figure 15.2 showing the posterior view of a male pelvic or gluteal region. Um, so number one points to the iliac crest. As we've said before, if you were to put your hands on your hips, the bony prominence that your hand rests on, that is your iliac crest. So number one is the iliac crest. What I do want you to know well, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, number two is the posterior superior iliac spine. So if you follow this iliac uh, crest now posteriorly, you will locate the, uh, a dimple on the skin sometimes. It, most people have this dimple. It's just more prominent in some than in others. Um, that is the um, posterior, uh, posterior superior iliac spine. All right. Number three is the coccyx. Coccyx is the, um, uh, it can be palpated very easily in the area just above the gluteal cleft. And if you, uh, the top of the gluteal cleft uh, number, uh, that is your, number three is the coccyx. Uh, number four is the um, greater trochanter. And here, what I want you to make a note of is the distance between the superior ili the iliac crest and the trochanter, okay? And we will come back to this. And I want you to compare this distance in the figure F and figure G. And this is how, you remember we talked about the difference in the anatomy of the male pelvis and the female pelvis? Um, and, and you saw the bones and how the male and the female pelvis is different. Uh, but in here you see from a surface anatomy point of view how it is different too. All right, so number four, that is a greater trochanter. Um, again, it, it is that bony landmark that can be palpated a lateral on the lateral part of your hip. And if you were to put your hand on that bony landmark and then flex and extend your uh, leg, you'll be able to feel the greater trochanter move. So that's your, how you know uh, that's the greater trochanter. All right, number five is the sacrum. Um, again, this is the joint between the sacrum and the ilium. Uh, the, um, the joint between the sacrum and the ilium is known as the sacroiliac joint. Um, so that'll be, you know, the area between the ilium and the sacrum. Number six is the gluteus, max, uh, gluteus medius muscle. If you were to shift weight from one leg to the other, and if you palpate that part um, just below your iliac crest, posteriorly, you will feel that muscle contract as you shift weight. So that is the gluteus medius muscle. And the bulk of the gluteal region is the gluteus maximus muscle. Um, again, um, uh, these are the sites for intramuscular injections. So many, many times intramuscular injections are either given in the deltoid muscle of the arm or in the uh, gluteus maximus or gluteus medius muscles. 
all right? And number eight is the ischial tuberosity. Again, this can be better felt in a sitting down position when you're sitting, especially on a hard surface, that bony prominence that touches the surface you're sitting on, that bony prominence, that is the ischial tuberosity, okay? Um, if you were to sort of open your hands such that you maximize the distance between your thumb and your forefinger, and then this open hand, put it on your, place it on your hips. You see how your thumb goes posteriorly, is at the back, and your fingers are pointing forwards? Right there at that level where the tip of your thumb is, just medial to that is where the kidneys are located. So that is important to know if you are doing a kidney, um, if you need to do a kidney um, biopsy or something, all right? Uh, so from a surface anatomy point of view, uh, that's where you know. And then there is a condition known as a pylorectal sinus, commonly seen in, um, uh, it's more common in males than in females. Again, more common in men who have more hair on their body. Um, also common in men who do uh, jobs that require them to um, sit for long periods of time, but also jobs that have a certain degree of sort of vibration to it. So for example, like drivers, uh, truck drivers. So if a man drives a truck for a long period of time, what happens is the hair from the back tend to collect and kind of sort of right at the top of the gluteal region. And those hair can actually um, poke the skin, poke through the skin, cause a sinus infection there. So pylorectal um, uh, sinuses can occur right there at the level of the coccyx. Uh, tailbone injuries are also common in people who may have had injuries that made them sort of, they fell back and landed on their butt, so to speak. They can actually uh, fracture uh, the tip of their coccyx or displace their coccyx. So sometimes um, people will have low backache as in pain in the coccyx region. And if it's just pain and strain and slight misalignment, it can be corrected. But if it is more than that, um, it can actually be fractured as well. All right, now I want you to look at the next figure. Again, keep in mind this distance between the superior, uh, the iliac crest and the greater trochanter. And now look at the same distance in the next figure. So here I wanted you to first pay attention to the distance between the iliac crest, that is that dotted line, number five, and the greater trochanter, that is number two. So you see this distance, you see the big difference between the male and the female pelvis? And again, I want you to go back and compare the two figures back and forth and see what a huge difference it makes in surface anatomy because of the difference in the shape of the pelvis. All right, amongst the numerous things that were different in the male and female pelvis, this is one of the things that is so clearly visible from a surface anatomy point of view, all right? Um, so number one here is the sacrum, number two is the greater trochanter of the femur, number three is the coccyx, number four is the gluteal cleft, Number five is the iliac crest. Number six is the posterior superior iliac spine. And number seven is the gluteus maximus muscle. All right, everything else remains pretty much the same. Um, so now we come to the surface anatomy of the upper limb. Um, this is figure 15.3a showing the right lateral view of the shoulder. Um, and we've come across all of these structures before. So number one is the um, acromion, number two is the spine of the scapula, number three is the deltoid muscle, mainly the uh, lateral fibers in this view. Uh, number four is the acromioclavicular joint, number five is the clavicle bone itself, and number six is the greater tubercle of the humerus. Now what I would like you to do is, you know, once you found this greater tubercle of the humerus, um, move your fingers a little more anteriorly and then um, abduct your arm. It'll be kind of sort of right here in this region. If you move your fingers anteriorly and abduct your arm, you will feel the tendon um, of the long head of your biceps and, and it will roll under your finger. Right there is that groove between the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle of the uh, humerus bone. Uh, so that is the intertubricular groove. 
So if you put your hands a little bit anterior and then abduct your hand, move your hand, abduct and adduct your hand, you will feel the tendon of the long head of the biceps sort of roll under your finger. That tendon is going through that groove between the greater and lesser tubercle of the humerus. All right. Um, what else? Coming to figure 15.3b, uh, number one is again the acromion, Num number two is the deltoid muscle, number three is the biceps brachii muscle, number four is the triceps uh, brachii muscle, number five is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. So again, I would like you to first of all find your electronon process, the easiest thing to find, the bony thing protruding out, and then I want you to um, in the lateral view, we can only see the lateral epicondyle. I'd like you to spend a minute to feel the medial epicondyle of the humerus too. And now if you put your finger and feel the gap between the allochronon process and the medial epicondyle, all right, you feel that gap. And if you kind of sort of roll your finger in there, that is what we call our funny bone. This is not the funny bone, it's your ulnar nerve going through that groove in there. And if you hit your elbow against the edge of the table or you know, corner of a, of, a, of a piece of furniture, that nerve gets injured and that's what sends that shooting pain down your forearm. And we say, you know, we call it a funny bone because of that funny sensation we get when that nerve um, uh, gets hit when we knock against furniture. All right, so I do want you to be able to find your medial epicondyle of the humerus and find that groove where the ulnar nerve goes through and see if you put your finger on it, are you able to get a sense of that sensation of the ulnar nerve uh, tingling a little bit. Okay, so now we come to, um, we come to figure 15.3a. Um, showing the medial view of the arm and the elbow. So again, we'll start where we left off at the previous figure. Find the olecranon process of the ulna, which is number three in this figure, and the um, medial epicondyle of the humerus, which is number four in this figure. And um, the ulna nerve goes through this groove in between these two structures. And that's what we call, you know, your funny bone, if you will. Um, so number one here is the biceps brachii muscle. Uh, pretty much everyone's quite familiar with that. I do need you to sort of flex your arm and trace the uh, biceps brachii down to its tendon. So that number two is the tendon of the biceps brachii muscle. Number three is olecranon process. Number four is the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Number five is your triceps brachii muscle. And number six is the groove on the brachia, uh, um, groove for the brachial artery. So this is on the border of the biceps brachii muscle. Again, another place where we feel for a pulse if for some reason we need to uh, assess the circulation in that limb. So that's your brachial artery going through, okay? Now we come to the anterior view of the cubital region. The cubital, the cubital region is this cube, the, the region around your elbow area. Now, one of the most uh, common clinical application of this region is for phlebotomists. Uh, this is the most common site for starting IV lines, whether the patient needs just an IV drip access to the veins before, for pre-op preparation before a patient goes into surgery, or pretty much any patient getting admitted into the hospital, one of the most common things is they want to have access to the vein. It's best to have access to the vein when the patient is, you know, still alert, awake, and oriented, and not wait for the patient to have a catastrophic event like a shock or, you know, something, because in that case, it becomes even more difficult to access veins. Um, so because this is the most common site to access veins, and as you can see, the veins can be, they're very superficial, and there are many veins that are easily accessible here, uh, and they're pretty decent-sized veins, which is what makes it so... Uh, attractive as the most popular site to get uh, access to IV lines. So number one here is your median cubital vein. That's one of your veins. And I will see if I can change my ink without messing things up here. All right. Um, so number one is your um, median cubital vein going down here. So I'll kind of sort of trace it as far as we can see it. 
Um, the number two is your biceps brachii muscle. Number three is again the cephalic vein. So you have another big vein coming down from up there, going down here. All right, that's your cephalic vein. And number four is your brachioradialis muscle. And as we said, you can put your hand over there on the lateral aspect of your forearm and then supinate and pronate your hand. You can feel your uh, brachioradialis muscle. And number five is the cubital fossa. So that's the fossa, the area, the region of the elbow. Um, and number six is your um, basilic vein. So you have another vein going down here. And as you can see, there's, there's, there's more venous network over here. There's another vein you can see going from back here. There's a lot of ve veins and anastomosis going on over here. Uh, there's another vein coming out from here going um, onto the dorsal surface. And the, as you come more distal, these veins get smaller. Um, so on the dorsal aspect of the hand is another common site to get access to IV lines. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, this surface, the uh, anterior surface of, at the wrist joint is also a common site. So there's veins going in here too. So these can be accessed as well. But again, because the veins at the cubital fossa are larger veins, they are just so much easier to have access to. So this is where we usually like to get access to the vein as soon as the patient is admitted into the hospital. And that is the most common reason why this area is uh, most common clinical application of this. Oh, and uh, the uh, median cuboidal vein is the, um, it, it connects, it's the vein that connects the lateral cephalic vein to the medial basilic vein. And not only are these good sites to start IV trips, but also to withdraw blood for all kinds of blood testing. So both to get access into the blood or to draw blood for testing, um, this site is very common. And now moving on to figure 15.3a, um, shows the anterior right wrist and hand. Uh, Everything's labeled over here. What I would like you to do is just spend some time identifying all these tendons and um, naming them. So if, you, if I were to give you this figure um, and it's not labeled, I need you to be able to um, label these parts. Um, so right here where the, find the wrist crease, and I'll change my ink or I can stick with a blue ink here. Right here, you can find the wrist crease. That's you know, an easy place to identify. Um, and then find these long tendons going into the wrist. So um, if we start laterally, you have your tendon of the flexor copy radialis muscle, okay? And then right in the center, the biggest, sort of the thickest one, if you will, will be the tendon of the palmaris longus muscle. And then you have the tendon um, of the flexor digitorum superficial, superficialis. All right, so these are the three main tendons if you can identify them right in the center. Just lateral to the tendon for the flexor copy radialis is where we look for the radial pulse. And I should probably do this with a red ink. So right here is where we feel for the radial pulse, right? So if you were to put the pulp of your finger gently right there, just lateral to the uh, tendon for the flexor copy radialis muscle, that is where we would feel a radial pulse. Again, a very common site to feel for pulse in patients to determine whether they're alive. Also a common site to get arterial blood if an arterial blood gas analysis is requested for. All right. Um, again, medially, uh, we have the tendon for the flexor copy ulnaris over here. Let me change back to blue ink since I was doing that with blue. Flexor copy ulnaris muscle tendon here. Um, and if you were to feel the bones, your carpal bones, the one bone that sort of sticks out on the medial aspect, that's your pisiform bone. All right, so if you were to sort of hit your hand on the table at the corner right there, that bone up there, that's your pisiform bone that sticks out. Thinner eminence is this eminence, the soft tissue formed at the ball of your uh, thumb, that's the thinner eminence. Now, some people will have a tiny branch of their radial artery break off and come superficially over here, and it can be seen pulsating. It's pretty cool if you find someone who has that. Um, 
Um, and then this little uh, fleshy eminence over here is your hypothenar eminence. So that's the eminence of the muscle on the uh, medial aspect. Moving on to figure 13.3 um, shows the dorsal view of the hand and wrist. One of the most prominent features here, as you can see, would be all the tendons that are visible and the dorsal venous arch. So uh, the dorsal venous arch is where there's a network of veins that are draining the, uh, the phalanges. Um, and as you can see, uh, the cephalic vein this is the cephalic vein here, um, and here's your dorsal venous arch. And it's sort of, you know, it's kind of wiggly, and you'll see little branches, uh, little branches draining into the dorsal venous arch, okay? Um, again, a common site for um, starting IV lines, and it drains into the cephalic vein. All of these here, you can see there's a nice, rich network of veins on the dorsal aspect of the hand. And this probably goes back here. So that's the dorsal venous arch. And we have a similar venous arch on the foot as well, but we'll get to that in a minute. All right. Um, identify the bony markings. So medially, you have the head of the ulna right here. Make sure you're able to palpate and locate the head of the ulna, and then the stylus process of the ulna. And I would encourage you to go back and look at the bone. Look at the ulna bone look on the bone where the head is and its relationship to the stylet process and imagine how that bone is now placed inside the arm and how you're able to feel it through the skin, all right? So once you know that, it'll be easy for you to remember it if you're asked to label a diagram. Um, and then on the lateral side, we have the uh, stylet process of the radius. And again, I need you to be able to palpate and identify the stylet process of the radius. And if you go just distal to the stylet process of the radius, you'll see this depressed area like a I don't want to call it a dimple, but it's like a depression, a groove between the tendons of the extensive pollutious longus and the extensive pollutious brevis muscle. And this is known as the anatomical snuff box because apparently people would put some stuff in it and sniff it or something. So that's why it's called a snuff box. All right. Um, and then we can also see the tendons of the extensor digitorum muscle on the dorsal aspect of the arm, of the hand. Moving on to the surface anatomy of the lower limb. First of all, I'd like you to identify the femoral triangle. It is not labeled in this diagram. Um, so the, the femoral triangle, um, it is on the medial aspect of the thigh. It is bordered laterally by the sartorius muscle and we'll identify that in a minute, medially by the gracilis muscle. And it's important is because, and the base of the triangle is the inguinal canal. The importance of this triangle is because the femoral artery, femoral vein, and the femoral nerve, all three very, very important structures pass through this, and they are pretty superficial, so they can be palpated. So if you were to lie down in a prone position and try and palpate near the base of this triangle, and I will draw the triangle in a minute, I don't want to fudge this up. All right, let's see. So this would be the inguinal canal, right? Um, the sartorius muscle starts way up here and crosses the thigh sort of medially like this. And the gracilis muscle is the medial most muscle here. So you see how this is the femoral triangle and your femoral artery, femoral vein, and femoral nerves, all three structures go right here and they're very superficial. Um, the importance of that is uh, for AV shunts, arteriovenous shunts, sometimes the femoral artery and femoral vein are accessed. So large shunts where you need access to a large blood vessel, um, this is sometimes used for that. Uh, whether it is for heme dialysis purposes or for any other purpose, if an arteriovenous shunt is required, this is a common site to get it, all right? So that is a femoral triangle. The base is the inguinal canal. Lateral border is the sartorius muscle. The medial border is the um, gracilis muscle. And the um, adductor longus muscle is also part of this uh, femoral triangle. All right. So number one is the sartorius muscle. 
Um, so this is the muscle that spans diagonally across the thigh. It starts anteriorly with the superior at the superior iliac spine and then goes down uh, to the medial region of the knee, all right, and forms the lateral border of the femoral triangle. Number two is the adductor longus muscle. Um, again, this is located in the superior part of the thigh in the femoral triangle, and it is just medial to the sartorius muscle. So number two in this diagram is the adductor longus muscle. Number three is the gracilis muscle. And again, this is on the medial border of the femoral triangle um, on the inner thigh. And this, its fibers run, run longitudinally from the pubic bone to the knee. Number four is the rectus femoris muscle. This is the largest muscle in the anterior compartment of the um, thigh. It is along the midline. It is quite superficial and is one of the largest bulky muscles of the quadriceps along the midline. All right, that's the rectus femoris muscle. Number five is the vastus lateralis muscle. Now this is a big bulky muscle on the lateral aspect um, of the thigh and it is again one of the quadriceps, quadriceps femoris groups. Uh, number uh, six is the vastus medialis muscle. So as the name suggests, this is your quadricep muscle that is on the medial surface of the thigh. And number um, seven is the lateral condyle of the femur. So again, I'd like you to spend a minute to make sure you're able to identify the lateral condyle of the femur and also then the lateral condyle of the tibia, which is number eight. All right. Uh, number nine is the patella. Patella is in the tendons of the quadricep muscles. And if you were to hold the patella, you can see, you know, if your knee's kind of sort of in a more relaxed position, you can actually move the patella a little bit, the kneecap. And then I want you to follow that kneecap, appreciate the tendons just below the patella muscle and see where they insert. And they insert into the tibial tuberosity, that bony prominence just below the patella. Um, uh, it is labeled number 13 in the figure here. It is this tendon here between the patella and the tibial tuberosity, the tendon of the quadricep muscles, that when you go to a doctor's office and they look, they want to look for muscle tone and or you know nervous uh, tone in in your body, uh, this is the tendon that is tapped to uh, elicit the knee uh, knee reflex. All right. Um, Number 10 is the medial condyle of the femur. Again, I, I'd like you to spend a minute to be able to identify that. Um, number 11 is the patella itself. Number 12 is the medial condyle of the tibia. Number 13 is the tibial tuberosity. Number 14 is the tibialis anterior muscle. So if you were to feel the um, anterior border of the tibia, that is number 15, the shin, the big bulky muscle just lateral to that. And if you dorsiflex your foot, you can feel that muscle contract. All right, that's your tibialis anterior muscle. And if you feel that muscle, trace that muscle down its tendon, you see how it crosses over and goes a little bit more medially before it attaches down at the ankle. All right, 16 is the fibularis longus muscle. And again, if you were to uh, palpate this muscle um, by plantar flexing your foot, all right, you can uh, feel that fibularis longus muscle. Number 17 is the medial malleolus of the tibia. Again, if you were to feel the medial aspect, you can, it's pretty easy to feel. It's a nice bony prominence jutting out in the medial aspect of your, above your ankle joint. Number 18 is the lateral malleolus of the fibula. Now remember, medial malleolus is of the tibia, but the lateral malleolus is of the fibula. And this juts out even more, it's even more prominent um, than the medial malleolus. 19 is a tendon of the extensor hallucis uh, longus muscles. If you were to dorsiflex your um, toe. Um, you'll be able to feel this tendon. And then um, Tendons of the extensor number 20 is the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus. Again, if you were to dorsiflex your toes, you would feel those tendons and they're pretty easily visible superficially. I would also like you to see if you can identify the dorsal venous arch on your foot and then look for a pedal pulse, all right? And I won't tell you where the pedal pulse is. How about you spend a minute, see where, um, 
research and find out where is the pedal pulse uh, medial to or lateral to which tendon and that is again uh, very important to know the status of circulation in a patient and for any other reason if no other artery can be easily accessed or whatever uh, pedal pulse is another area where we check for pulse in a patient all right so now we come on to the posterior surface of the lower limb um, in the posterior surface of the lower limb, as you know, those muscles at the back of the leg are the hamstring muscles. And if you were to feel those muscles and feel their tendons as they cross the knee joint, uh, number one here is the biceps femoris tendon. Um, so it's that, it's that rope-like tendon um, going down on the lateral aspect of the knee. Number two is the gastrocnemius muscle. This is the muscle that forms the big bulk of the posterior surface of the uh, lower leg. Um, and if you were to extend your leg and um, you would be able to feel the two heads, the medial and lateral head of the gastrocnemius muscle and feel the tendon as it goes down, that is what forms the calcaneal tendon because it attaches to the calcaneus muscle, or the, uh, calcaneal bone, that is number four, also known as Achilles tendon. So this is your Achilles tendon, uh, the calcaneal tendon. Number three, is the soleus muscle. Soleus muscle is flatter, it lies deep to the gastrocnemius. Um, it extends laterally from the gastrocnemius muscle and its tendon is in the middle and distal portion of the calf. And it can be palpated if you plant or flex your foot. Number five is the um, tendon of the semi uh, tendon of the semitendinous muscle. Again, this is a rope-like tendon uh, that crosses the knee joint medially. So that is the medial border, border of the popliteal fossa. Number six is your biceps femoris muscle, and number seven are your semitendinous and semimembranous muscle. What I would like you to do is try to identify the diamond shaped popliteal fossa and see if you can identify all the boundaries of the popliteal fossa. You know, just in preparation for a potential question on a quiz or an exam. Can you identify the boundaries of the popliteal fossa? All right. And with that, I think that is the end of our chapter. Thank you.